Towards the end of November, some of my friends told me that the FNAF Ultimate Guide could be found in stores early, so I checked the Indigo website and it said that it, one near me had 10 of the book. Then we called Indigo and they said they had it. So I went to Indigo and went to the section with the FNAF books and it turns out they didn't have it. Obviously I have the book now, but that was kinda sad. But while I was there, I thought, why not get one of the few FNAF books that I don't actually have? Step closer. Now after the Twisted Ones and Fourth Clouds of Graphic Novels, I'm only missing one, Bunny Call. But while I don't have Bunny Call, I thought I should read Step Closer and keep an eye out for any interesting details that may be in this story. If you didn't know, before Step Closer, I actually strongly believed Mike Victim, shame on me. But my friend Glitch Bear directed me to a video where this British dude talked about the gum and turning purple stuff in Step Closer, and that converted me to Mike Bro, and I've been a firm believer in it ever since. And interestingly enough, after that I actually joined the tiny little British man's Discord server, and after a certain time, he invited me to a content creator server, and now we're friends. At least try to comb your hair, you look just like Rick Astley, and I think I might throw up, your face looks super ghastly. He's such a nice fellow. Bleeding from my ears and bleeding from my eyes, impulse heaven is the devil in disguise, the crying child's here. So looking through this book, I found 18 new details. And not only that, but there's also some parts of this book that may hint at lore for security breach. I'll point out those sections at the end of the video, so stick around to the end. I, I'll only touch on the theory briefly in this video, but I'll explain the full theory in a theory video I'm working on in the future. But now we need to talk about the details I found, so let's just get straight into it. Number 1. In the game universe, Mrs. Afton seems to have died at some point before all the murders and stuff, but it seems like before that, it's also possible that William and Mrs. Afton actually got divorced. This story may actually be hinting at that. It's also hinted at in the Security Reach tapes where Vanessa told a fake past where her parents divorced and her father Bill, which is short for William might I add, manipulated her into saying bad things about her mother in order for him to get custody. But after that, something bad happens to the mother. She most likely dies. I've read through all your files, so I feel like we've been talking for weeks. I feel like I know your dad, too. Bill, right? Your dad's name was Bill? I'm sorry, what did you say? I try to do what I'm supposed to do. I know you do. Your supervisor notes that you follow instructions perfectly. Your dad made you follow instructions, didn't he? I'm talking about the custody battle between your mum and your dad. Your dad didn't play fair, did he? He used to make your mum look bad in court. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Do you want to talk about how that felt? I suppose I don't need you to tell me it felt bad to have a parent scare you into saying things that weren't true. He manipulated you. It wasn't your fault. It's really sad, but it's common for one parent to use their child to hurt the other parent. I know your mom after she lost the custody case. And while this backstory is fake, it could actually be a story Glitchtrap gave her, and it was a real backstory, but rather than for Vanessa, more likely a real backstory of one of William's children, most likely Elizabeth. But the point is, it seems like this story hints at a divorce really happening in the game timeline, but then Mrs. Afton dies later on after the divorce. Number 2. It's stated in this story that Pete and Chuck's parents couldn't really be bothered to look after Chuck, and so they made Pete do it, and that made him bitter towards him. It's been pretty well established that Mike bullies the bite victim because of jealousy, but it's also possible that he was always jealous, but after William and Mrs. Afton divorced, Mike had to look after the bite victim, which pissed him off even more, which could be what prompted Mike to actually bully the bite victim. If Mike had to look after the bite victim, it would also explain why William is never home in the FNAF 4 minigames, and why only Mike is ever around. Number 3. Here's an interesting quote from the book. Sometimes he felt like a ticking time bomb about to explode, like the tension was just under his skin begging for release. End quote. 
This is interesting to me because Pete is a Mike parallel, and thinking that there's tension under his skin seems like a reference to Ennard and dislocation being inside Mike's body, but we'll talk about that more later with another detail. Next up we have actually have a few connections to the FNAF 4 bite. Number 4. Pete dragging Chuck over to the maintenance room and Chuck begging for him to stop really reminds me of when Mike and his friends are dragging the bite victim towards the stage in the bite minigame. This also leads to the next detail, number 5. It's stated that Chuck has always been scared of Foxy. While Pete having a connection to Foxy is certainly a connection to Mike being Foxy bro, Foxy in this story may also have a double parallel as he seems to be the Fredbear stand-in for this story. And once again this ties into the next detail as well, number 6. A lot of people still believe Pete in this story is a parallel to Mike, but the roles between Pete and Chuck are switched making Pete more of a bite victim parallel, but we can debunk this very easily with the very first scene due to the fact that it literally shows a vulgar older brother bullying his younger brother and dragging him to an animatronic he's afraid of. But not only that, if we actually think about what else happens here, it has heavy parallels to the storyline under Mike Bro. An older brother with a connection to Foxy pulls a prank on his little brother by bringing him to a Freddy's character he's scared of, a prank which goes horribly wrong and later calls, causes the older brother to have nightmares and deeply regret doing the prank, and later on he sets to, out to fix the mistake. This is the entire Mike Bro story basically. And this goes to show that Pete is very clearly a Foxy Bro parallel and not a Bite Victim one, which can be used as even further evidence that Mike is Foxy Bro, though honestly I think that's pretty simply true at this point, but yeah, whatever. Number 7. After the prank on Chuck goes wrong, Pete has a nightmare where he's completely drenched in blood. Then he wakes up and he immediately goes to throw up. I'll talk about this in the next detail, but let me just talk about something else first. So basically, after he throws up, he ends up being late to biology class, so when he walks into class he sits next to a dude wearing a leather jacket and who has purple hair. Honestly, whenever I see the mention of the color purple in a FNAF book, I go into full on detective mode, but honestly it's unclear whether or not it actually means anything. Anyway, in class today, Pete had to dissect a frog. About 10 minutes in, the purple hair guy tells Pete to watch as he squishes the, the frog's eyeball. Pete says he needs a break, and gets up but then the purple haired dude cuts off the frog's arm and waves at Pete with it. Obviously this is because of the curse, trolling him basically, but the interesting thing here is that it's a dude with purple hair doing this. Again, it's unclear if it means anything, but I thought it was worth mentioning, especially since not very often do I hear people talking about this part. Number 8. Nearly every time something would happen involving the curse, Pete would get dizzy. When he first had the nightmare about being drenched in blood, he woke up and instantly went to the bathroom to throw up. When he fell on the ground and the scalpel almost hit his eye, Pete knew he hadn't hit his head, but he felt dizzy. Right before the butcher's cleaver fell and almost sliced his arm, he started getting dizzy again. Right before the fishing hook got caught under Pete's eye, he started feeling like someone had their hand on his stomach and was pushing hard on it. This goes on and on later on. This goes on and on. It happens more throughout the book. This is something to note about the curses. They make you dizzy or sick. Number 9. I honestly can't believe I haven't seen anyone talk about this at all. Pete and Chuck's dad is named Bill. Bill is a nickname for William. This is not a coincidence. Like, I'm genuinely confused as to why no one talks about this. Obviously, it's not William Afton, but the fact that their dad is named William clearly shows that they are meant to represent the Afton family. Number 10. Pete going fishing in this story could possibly be a hint that Michael Afton is actually old man consequences. It's something I've talked about in videos before, but something I failed to mention was the audio in the background of the old man consequences minigame from Ultimate Custom Night. <laughs> Well, it's either his tormented screams or, you know, Scott Cawthon shouting through a fan. It sounds like William screaming for Mike to help him. Why would he be screaming for Mike in this minigame specifically, unless Mike appears in this minigame? This also explains why Bill, the William stand-in for this story, goes fishing along with Pete because both Michael and William appear in that All Man Consequences minigame. Number 11. Here's another interesting quote from the story. His dad didn't use an accusing tone, but Pete could feel his disapproval, just like he had with his messy room. His dad had always acted like it was Pete's fault when things went the wrong way." End quote. This seems to be a reference to how in the games, William seems to heavily ignore Mike. This is hinted at in The Immortal and the Restless as well as Midnight Motorist since Mike tells William to leave the bite victim alone, but he straight out ignores him and bangs on the bite victim's door. Number 12. When Pete and Chuck finally end up getting along, their mom walks into Chuck's room when they're playing video games and when she asks if they want popcorn, Pete is quick to say that he would like some popcorn, but Chuck doesn't say anything about popcorn, he asks for a juice box. 
This could be a reference to Mike and Sis location eating popcorn while watching The Immortal and the Restless. On a similar note, number 13, after all, all the quote unquote freak accidents, Pete doesn't want to leave the house, so he just stays home and watches TV, which again could be a reference to The Immortal and the Restless, as well as Midnight Motors, where we see Mike on the couch watching TV. Number 14. After Chuck forgives Pete for the Foxy prank, he tells Pete that in order to break the curse, he needs to go back to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and that Chuck's forgiveness won't matter unless he does that. At this one, it's very clear, actually it's factual, that in FNAF 4 we play as Mike. This story also hints at that in a detail I'll talk about after this one. But stories like Blackbird and Pizza Kit hint that it's the crying child torturing Mike in FNAF 4, and it's also very likely that the bite victim is Nightmare Fredbear. But in the files of FNAF 4, Nightmare is referred to as Shadow Freddy. Nightmare is Shadow Freddy, but the bite victim isn't Shadow Freddy, so was it possible that in FNAF 4, the bite victim put some type of curse on Mike which drew in Shadow Freddy in some way, and caused Shadow Freddy to start giving Mike nightmares, possibly with the bite Fight victim invading them as well at some point. This story could also be hinting that the FNAF 4 nights take place right before FNAF 3 or possibly even FNAF 6 since as Chuck says Mike has to go back to the place where the curse was created aka the place where the bite of 83 incident happened meaning Mike has to go to Fredbear's but if FNAF 4 is right before FNAF 6 that could actually support Krakoa's theory that the FNAF 6 building is a redesigned version of Fredbear's family diner. It would make sense not only since both have a red door, but it would make sense with the fact that in Security Breach we get Fredbear's posters because the FNAF 6 building is under the Pizzaplex. What? So it yep. was true. <laughs> Freddy good. Fazbear's Pizza Place. That's that, Yeah, that's FNAF 6. It would also make sense since Mike's house is nearby, as we know from the appearance of Mike's room in Security Breach. <gasps> Out, I hear a sound. I hear something I recognize. The camera. Is the camera? Being friends? Yup. Oh my god. I'm so glad I, you made me get these claws. <laughs> what are you doing? I the door? Oh, yeah, I did actually. Oh my f This is f This is sister location! It's Michael's room. What the f if you're wondering why I don't think Mike's room is a replica, or if you're wondering more about FNAF 6 being Fredbear's, check out my recent Security Breach gameplay video where we collect the final two CDs and listen to them on, while on a call with Krakoa and Arcade Endo, and we discuss more about theories on the game in the video. Long story short, not only does this story hint at the lore of Security Breach, but it also gave a few massive hints at FNAF 4 and FNAF 6. Number 15. Pete has a nightmare with Foxy and Foxy alone coming into his room, crushing his arm and popping his eye with a hook. When he wakes up from the nightmare, he feels like he had a version of this nightmare before, but only now, he remembered every detail. Not only that, but he thinks the nightmare felt very, very real. The fact that he thinks he had a nightmare like this before makes me definitely think about the FNAF 4 nights and how Mike has the same nightmare over and over again, but more extreme every time. Also, the fact that only Foxy was in his nightmare could be a reference to Night 5 of FNAF 4 where only Nightmare Fredbear is there. Number 16. I don't think I'm the first person to bring this up, but I think it's important to mention Pete's friend Maria gets his hand stuck in a finger trap as a prank. This could be a reference to the plush trap kid in FNAF 4 who tells the bite victim that his father tells him his Spring Bonnie plushie is a finger trap. Number 17. Follow up on the finger trap, as we all know it turns Pete's hand purple which is evidence of Pete being a Mike parallel. But what's interesting is, is the implication of this. This seems to be telling us that the reason Mike turns purple in Sister Location is because of bruising. If you didn't know, a bruise is basically your blood pushed up against and underneath your skin. And this would make sense as to why Mike turns purple. Since Ennard Ener is inside him and moving around, he's pushing Mike's blood and organs outward and against his skin, which is most likely why Mike turns purple. Bruising. And finally, number 18. Four weeks after Pete died, Chuck went back to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza because something had, had, had been pushing him to do so. We know from other Fazbear Frights stories like Fetch and the New Kid that Freddy's locations can sometimes lure in children who have suffered in their lives in some way. In Chuck's case, obviously he has suffered with the loss of Pete himself. The question is, why was Chuck lured in if nothing ended up happening? 
Maybe we'll never know, but those are all the details I found. Now let's move on to the details in the story that may hint at some security breach lore. Something you may have noticed about Gregory in Security Breach is that he has a band-aid over seemingly cut right under his eye. Back when we first saw the images of the Security Breach statues, I immediately thought of how Pete and Step Closer got cut underneath his eye from a fishing hook as well as a dart in the mirror maze at his pirate-themed homecoming. I eventually decided that it was likely just a coincidence due to the fact that Gregory doesn't seem to have any similarities with Pete. Or does he? In the files of Security Breach, we can find that some of the voice lines are, were actually censored by Steel Wool, but we can see the original version of each line in the files. We can actually find that Freddy's voice line towards the beginning of the game when he says, I feel something is wrong, was originally supposed to be, your arm is cut badly. And after that, there's a reaction from Gregory saying, ah, my arm. Now there is no way this is a coincidence, because in Step Closer, a buzzsaw cuts Pete on the arm. Badly. Not only that, other stories besides Step Closer have something happen to someone's arm. In Into the Pit, Spring Bonnie bites Oswald in the arm. In Lonely Freddy, the arm of the Yarg Foxy is ripped off. And in The New Kid, Golden Freddy bites Devin on the arm. And now with Step Closer and both the eye and arm connection, there is no way this can be a coincidence. What if the events of Step Closer actually give us a clue as to who Gregory is? And I'm not talking really about the actual events, I'm talking about the curse. Not only that, but the first person to notice something weird is happening with Pete is none other than his younger brother Chuck, a character who seems to represent the crying child. What's more is that when Chuck sees Pete after the fish hook accident, he thinks Pete looks like Frankenstein, which could be a reference to Dreadbear, a character who also seems to represent the bite victim. FNAF AR also seems to hint at curses being relevant with the Cursed Springtrap skin. It's not even called Cursed Springtrap, it is only called Curse. So is it possible that curses are actually relevant to the FNAF game lore? Is it possible that curses can actually help us solve the lore of Security Breach? Maybe it can. There's a few things to note about curses. One, whenever the curse causes something to happen, the person with the curse gets dizzy or begins feeling sick. Number two, if someone dies while they have the curse, they will be able to still hear and feel everything around their body, but they won't be able to move or speak. Number three, in order to free yourself from the curse, you have to go back to the place where the curse first started. And number four, a curse will make someone have nightmares and or hallucinations. What do you guys think about curses possibly being relevant to FNAF? I know I didn't talk too much about the theory I have about Step Closer connecting Security Breach in this video, but in my upcoming Gregory and Freddy video, I will certainly talk more about the theory. Also, I'd love to know your opinions on Step Closer. Do you enjoy the story? Let me know in the comments down below. I really enjoyed the story, I would probably rank it as either top of A tier or bottom of S tier. It was a great story. But guys, I have one last thing to briefly mention in this video. In this video, we have discussed how Step Closer may hint at some lore for Security Breach, but Step Closer is not the only story to do that. We have a lot more to talk about for future videos, like how Dance With Me can hint at Glitch Trap and Mrs. Afton, and we will especially talk more about how the Twisted Ones can possibly hint at more lore in Security Breach, and an epic idea that I have for Security Breach and the future of FNAF. And I'll just say right now, I doubt that idea is true, but it's a really cool idea, and even if it's not true, it's fun to think about it, so I'll talk about it all in what will probably be my next theory video on the Twisted Ones and their connection to Security Breach. Anyways, thanks to all you guys for watching, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and check out some of my other videos like my Acton Security Breach Theory, or the details I found in the Twisted Ones and Fourth Closet Graphic Novels. But apart from that, I hope you all enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys!